Today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to make wine from frozen grapes. What I've got in this bucket is five gallons of 2017 Sangiovese from Brem Vineyards. What Brem will do is they'll flash freeze crush and distemmed grapes right off the vineyard from all these vineyards and they'll ship them straight to your door. So this is from Santa Giordano Vineyard in Carneros, California, which is in Sonoma County. So this is a great, great place to get grapes. These particular grapes are from 2017. This is 2020. So what Peter Brem told me was that you really should see no degradation in quality, even though these grapes are three years old. So we're going to give that a try. And what I've noticed already looking at them is they look completely wonderful. They look as good as any grapes I've ever gotten fresh. So I am pretty confident in what we have here. What's great about frozen grapes is if you just want to get started in making wine from grapes, and I do recommend making wine from grapes if you want to make a premium, premium red wine, you don't need to invest right away in a crusher destemmer, which can cost you, you know, four or five hundred dollars and up. You can get frozen buckets of grapes anywhere in the country, and you can get them any time of the year. So this is just a cool option in the off season. Now they are going to be a little bit more expensive. So it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to freeze your base level budget grapes. So they're only going to freeze pretty premium level grapes here. So I don't, I do think you're getting your bang for your buck when you're buying these grapes, but know that you're going to spend a little bit of money on a bucket like this. This bucket that we'll make all said and done starts at five gallons. When we're finished with this, we'll probably have about three gallons of wine, which is 15 bottles. You're looking at about $180 for those 15 bottles. So you better do a pretty good job and make a pretty good wine. But if you do everything right, you could have a wine that would easily cost $30, $40. Because like I said, you're dealing with some very, very premium grapes here. Now, Brem Vineyards will list the number. So they'll tell you your pH, they'll tell you your TA, titratable acidity, they'll tell you the percent sugar, and they'll tell you the YAN, yeast assimilable nitrogen. Bucket to bucket, those numbers could vary a little bit because all through that vineyard, you could get a little bit of different grapes. If you were to buy a handful of buckets, um, what Brem told me is at nine buckets, you're pretty much gonna get exactly what those numbers say on that chart. If you buy one bucket, you could get a little bit off. Well, I have one bucket. So I ran some tests on this just to see where we stand and see how close we are to those numbers on the sheet. And on the sheet, we saw pH of 3.48. It looks like I'm at about 3.51, pretty darn close. I'm very happy with that number. The percent sugar was 24 and a half percent on paper and these actual grapes are sitting at about 23 percent so still a pretty good number still very happy with that i didn't measure the yan i didn't measure the ta i usually don't make adjustments based on ta early in the process like this i'm really just adjusting based on ph i did measure the free so2 just out of curiosity because normally what i'll do is i'll sulfite a little bit right off the crusher just to knock down any wild bacteria off the vineyard. And I'm getting a measurement of about five parts per million of free SO2. So they probably did add a tiny bit of sulfite right off the crusher. Now these grapes come frozen solid as a rock. What's, what I did was I heated them up to about 40, 40, 45 degrees. And I left them like that for about five days. So that's basically replicating a cold soak, which is something that I'll pretty much always do with my wines. And what that does is it just helps extract a little bit more color, just help extract a little bit more flavor and some of those more water soluble components before you start raising up that alcohol level of the wine. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to get started. I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing to this wine. If you want to buy this exact bucket, these buckets are still available. You can follow along and make this exact wine that I'm making. 
Now based on my numbers, 3.51, that's right on the edge of the range that I'm happy with to start with my pH. It's going to climb a little bit during fermentation. It's going to climb a little bit more during malolactic fermentation. I might be a little happier down at about 3.45, but we're going to get the fermentation started before I do any acid adjustments with tartaric acid because once it starts extracting a little bit more, we just don't know exactly where that number is going to go. I'm also pretty happy with the sugar. I'm not going to go ahead and add any sugar. I've got some wines that are great blending partners for this wine, or so I think or theorize. I've got a cab and a Merlot that the alcohol is a little bit high on. This one at 23% sugar should yield somewhere around 13% alcohol. Those other ones are in the 14.515. I think they'll make great blending partners. And what that will make, so Sangiovese plus Cab and Merlot is normally what you call a super Tuscan. Now that's an Italian thing. Those are usually grapes from Italy. These are from California. But we're gonna probably make ourselves a super Tuscan style wine with this Sangiovese. But I won't do any blending until it's all done aging and I really know if that's how it best blends. The yeast that I'm going to use is D21. It's a very reliable fermenter, um, has relatively low nitrogen needs, and I think it'll do a good job on this Sangiovese here. I am going to use Go Firm just to beef up that yeast a little bit, um, make sure it's got all its nutritional needs before it even gets into the fermenter. I did add some enzymes towards the end of the cold soak. Um, there's a lot of options out there on the market, but I just use your basic pectic enzyme on this. And what that'll do is really help aid in the extraction. You'll really see those skins start to break down nicely towards the end of that fermentation. And that was about 12 hours ago now. You don't really want to add that too close to any time you might add something like tannin or um, too close to when the alcoholic fermentation starts. So. Those have been working away. I'm starting to see a little bit of color extraction in this wine. And um, I think we're about ready to kick off the fermentation. So let's go ahead and get a yeast starter going. Starting to get some pretty active bubbling in the yeast starter here. This D21 never really gets all that foamy on the starter, but here a little bit of snap crackle pop in there, so that's a good sign. Um, I've added a little bit of wine must to it to do two things. It's basically bringing the temperature closer to the temperature of the wine, and it's kind of helping that yeast really multiply, giving it a little bit of sugar to feed on, and it's kind of helping the whole transition, so you're not really having much of an acid jump or anything too crazy when you add to the wine. So what we'll do now is we'll just take this starter and we'll pour it right onto the top of our wine must. The temperature of this must is about 70 degrees right now, so I'm going to try to keep it there until I start to see some visible signs of fermentation. When I see signs of fermentation, I'm gonna move it into a bigger bucket. I probably actually should have done that before, but got a little ahead of myself here. I'm just afraid in this little small bucket, we might um, get a little too high as the skins start to really fill up with CO2 and float to the top. Just set a loose lid on there for now. It's been about 48 hours since we've started the wine and within about six hours I was really starting to see those first signs of fermentation. So you're seeing a little bit of bubbles and the skins are just starting to fill with CO2 and lift a little bit to the surface. But starting at about usually about 12 hours what you're going to have to start doing is punching down the wine. So I've got my punch down tool here. This is a punch buddy, which you can get on my website, smartwinemaking.com. It's basically a screwdriver handle with a stainless rod and a disc at the end. And this works awesome for little 
buckets of wine, so little home wine making size wine buckets. But what you're doing with that punch down is you're submerging that cap of skins, which is going to rise usually two to four inches off the top of that wine surface, and it would otherwise dry out. It would start to oxidize. So you're kind of submerging that, churning it up a little bit, and you're going to do that at a minimum once per day. I like to do it three times a day. I do it when I wake up, I do it when I get home from work, and I do it before I go to bed. Um, and that's pretty good three times a day. I, I personally wouldn't do it less than two times a day until the very end of the fermentation when things are really, really slowing down and I just don't want to open the lid on that bucket to expose it to more oxygen. So <clears throat> when I first started this fermentation, we were up at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's enough to get that yeast kicking. But what I did is I put a space heater on it. So I warmed that wine up to about 85 degrees, give or take. I was in the 83 to 86 or 87 range. And that sounds pretty hot, but what we're doing is we're really extracting those water-soluble flavors and phenols from those wines. Now, after two days, like if I were to keep it at 85 degrees, it's gonna rip right through that fermentation. We're gonna be done in four days and it's gonna be bone dry. After two days, we're at about 10% sugar. We started at about 23% sugar. So what I'm going to do now that we're getting a little bit higher alcohol, we're running that sugar down, is I'm going to chill it back down. We're going to finish the fermentation off in the low 70s and drag it out. We're going to extract a little bit less of the alcohol soluble stuff, which is usually the, it's not bad, but it's going to be like your seed tannins and things. You're not going to want to just majorly extract that stuff. So we're going to cool it down. I took the space heater off. And we're just going to kind of let it go at its natural temperature, which down here in the basement is probably going to be about, mm, I mean, it's probably going to try to go under 70. So I might have to lift it up a little bit with a little bit of heat. And we're going to give it just a little bit of nutrient. Normally I would give it a little bit more, but this, these grapes had a pretty good amount of nitrogen right from the start. The, the yeast assimilable nitrogen was pretty healthy on these. So I'm going to use Fermade K. It's going to add a little bit of nitrogen and it's going to have yeast hulls it's going to, and it's also going to contain the micronutrients that you're going to want. So it's kind of a more complex nutrient and I'm only going to add four grams to this five gallon. So it's going to be a pretty light dose. And if we were to smell any, it's hydrogen sulfide. That's a that's a good sign that you're a little bit starved of air. You're probably a little bit starved of nitrogen. So if that were to happen, we would probably add a little bit more nutrient. I'd probably, instead of having the plastic lid on the fermenter, I'd replace it with just a loose towel. Try to expose that wine to a little bit of air and I'll let that yeast respirate instead of um, ferment quite so much. It'll kind of help it multiply and just to relieve a little bit of stress on that yeast and bring things back to good health. So in here, I've just got some of the wine must. I'm just gonna mix my nutrient in this must and we're gonna pour it in during the punch down here. And then what I also like to do, this, this is some um, uh, tannin. This is a fermentation tannin. It's called FT Rouge, this particular brand. It's from um, Scott Laboratories, I believe, but it's from Cellar Science, which you can get at morewine.com or morewinemaking.com. I'll put a link to all this stuff in the description. I'm going to add five grams. So it's going to be about one gram per gallon of this fermentation tannin. And I'm going to do it during this punch down. I don't like to do it right at the time of adding enzymes or anything like that because it'll kind of reduce the effectiveness of those enzymes. So we're going to add it now. I'll add five grams now and I'm probably going to add a little bit more in a few more days. Just try to help bind up that color. This can kind of help reduce like herbaceous tastes in the wine. I don't think we're going to get a lot from these grapes. Um, it's going to help improve mouth feel. I usually, I mean, I can't say that I've almost ever felt that I've had too much tannin. 
with these homemade wines, you're almost always going to struggle in the other direction where you just don't have enough tannin. And I, I don't know exactly why. I mean, some theories, I think these really, really small batches, they ferment so fast. If I was in a, in a big, you know, two or one ton tote, I might be able to drag out that 85 degree temperature for um, three or four days before I cool it back down. But man, it was just ripping through that fermentation. So I, I decided to chill it a little bit early here so we don't get, you know, run dry really quickly. So we're going to go ahead and we're just going to going to add these to the punch down. I did do some testing on this juice. That's how I know it's at um, about 10% sugar right now. I mentioned that I thought I might need to add a little bit of tartaric acid. Well, I'm glad I didn't because we're now, we started about 3.51. We've dipped to about 3.3 pH and um, that could just be some more acids releasing from those skins. It's just hard to predict what's going to happen when those grapes really start to break down. I can tell you probably had very, very little potassium because a lot of times the exact opposite will happen and that pH will start to climb if you've got a high potassium must. We're not seeing that at all. And I'm still going to leave it. I think it's going to be all right. We're going to probably still climb a little bit from that 3.3 and we're going to go through malolactic fermentation. And if we can finish this wine in the um, 3.5, 3.6 range, I'm going to be really happy with that, I think. We've already just punched down them. You can see how quickly the skins have already rose back to the surface. And every time we punch down, we're just going to be monitoring the smells. You want this to start out smelling like, like fruity, fruity, like almost like a blackberry pie would be a good smell descriptor for a lot of these wines during a healthy fermentation. See all these bubbles coming up. It's really roaring right now. And um, seeing what I'm seeing, I'm a little <laughs> nervous to add a lot of nutrient right now, but we're going to add that. It's probably going to bubble up a little bit. But like I said, we're really trying to cool this wine down. We're going to kind of slow that fermentation down. A little bit of air is not the worst thing right now. It's actually good for it. Um, it really helps the yeast cells do the budding process with the air. Now we're going to work in a little bit of that fermentation tannin. Like I said, we'll do this probably one more time. really help this, thinks, think this helps to add, um, just kind of round out the wine, take off a little bit of the edge, create a little bit nicer mouth feel, and lock up the color, which with a Sangiovese, that's going to be a lot of a challenge, so a little extra tannin could be a little helpful there with these particular grapes. And I'm punching this down. I'm making sure I'm not going to smash the seeds on the bottom, so I'm not smashing it off the bottom. But I do want to churn up everything on the bottom. You don't want to get that compacted layer of leaves down there that could kind of contribute to the, to the stink or the hydrogen sulfide, which you would call reductive if you ever were to get that. Now every day or two, I'll just take a paper towel just wipe some of these skins off here so we don't get too much dried out stuff on the side. And now we're just going to monitor it. Keep punching it down, keep an eye on that temperature, and watch for when the skins kind of stop rising. You're going to see the, the um, specific gravity or the bricks on your hydrometer drop to about um, probably about negative one or so bricks or about 0.998 if you're doing specific gravity. And when that happens, it's going to be time to press these grapes with your grape press. The fermentation's just about wrapped up. You can usually tell when the grape skins kind of stop rising so high to the surface. There's still just a little bit of bubbling going, but for the most part, we're just about finished with fermentation. Um, it's been about 10 days since the start. So those first couple days we ran it real hot. Things are looking really, really good. 
we saw a pretty good drop in pH once the juice really started to extract from those skins and pulp and things started to really break down. So the pH really swung down from 3.51 to about 3.28, 3.3, which is a little bit low for what I want. So I gave it a really, really small addition of potassium carbonate. So what that'll do is that'll bring the pH up just a hair and whatever that bag of potassium carbonate says, never add the amount that it recommends for the pH shift that you want. Always give it a little test. I only added about a gram to this and we moved our pH by about 0.1 to 3.4. So that's a pretty good place to be. Since fermentation has continued, um, we're now up to about 3.45 and I'm very, very happy with that number. So we've got our little wine press all sanitized. I just used some star sand for that. I make a big bin of it, slosh it around good in there. Um, I've got a, a strainer, so I don't need to use any kinds of bags or anything here. It'll just run through the slats and the strainer will pick out any seeds or some of the real chunky stuff. I run it through a funnel and I'm gonna run this into a five gallon carboy. That should hopefully be enough for what we've got here and we'll just give it a press so we're first going to just dump our bucket in and we're not going to dump too fast because things could really go flying overshoot our funnel if we're not careful And it, these skins are really, really very broke down. Using those enzymes really breaks down the skins pretty heavily versus when you don't use the enzymes. So what you'll see right now is this wine is a little cloudy. And that's typical from when you use enzymes like I did. We're going to for sure have to rack this off this five gallon carboy because we're going to probably get, you know, a good two inches of sediment dropping out when this all settles in a couple days here. And ultimately what I'll end up storing it in is a three gallon carboy topped up to the very top of the neck. And I'll probably, you know, I might need to use a growler also just to take up all the volume. And I just have to spray the strainer out once or twice here because it kind of gets a little clogged up here. So yeah, I'll probably have to spray it twice through this whole batch of grapes. Got my punch down tool here just to kind of work out all that free run before we start pressing here. Normally I'd keep this stuff separate and I'd have a few carboys of free run and then I'd have you know one carboy of pressed wine and I can press really hard that way. And you know, you can't really over press in that situation because I can selectively blend that back in to the free run wine to kind of dial it in just like I want. But in this case, what I'll do, since I don't have a lot of wine, I'm just gonna mix all the press and free run. And I'll, I'm gonna press moderately hard. These basket presses are really pretty gentle. It's pretty hard to over press it with a little press like this. I did make a couple additions before um, dumping into the press here. Since I'm using that D21 yeast, it really doesn't produce hardly any SO2 naturally. Like a lot of yeast will actually do that. The Lalvin EC1118 will naturally produce a lot of SO2. This one won't. So I've added just 10 parts per million, which is about um, 0.4 grams of potassium metabisulfite to this and that's not going to do hardly anything but it's gonna help scavenge a little bit of the oxygen that we get here when we're pressing and I actually don't mind the oxygen I just don't want too much of it at this point oxygen is still not really a bad thing I just don't want to overdo it it's too much of a good thing can start to oxidize our wine a little bit so here we are, the free run's just about off, and we're gonna go throw our plates in here and we'll give this a press. And it is 
Not going to take much. I could probably press twice this much in this little basket press with just one go at it. One tip is never wear white clothes when you're pressing wine. Every once in a while you'll get a squirt of wine just come shooting out of the side of your press. You really want to press outside if you can, but it's kind of winter time right now, so I'm just going to press down in here in the little workshop. We got about four gallons, I'd say, of wine here. And we're gonna lose a lot of that, so we're gonna probably lose at least a half a gallon by the time we let this wine settle out. So I'm thinking we're gonna have about just over three gallons, maybe three and a half gallons of finished wine when this is all said and done. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw an airlock on here and we're gonna let this kind of settle for a couple days, let it um, bubble for a couple days more. And you don't want to let it sit too long, because if you let it sit on those, they're called the gross lees, the heavy stuff that settles out of the wine. If you let it sit on there for too long, what will start to happen is you start to get a little bit of a stressed yeast condition, and you're going to create some hydrogen sulfide, which is just something you don't really want to deal with in wine. That's that rotten egg type of smell. So to try to eliminate that or minimize that, you really only want to let it settle out for a couple days here, rack it off those gross leaves and get it into a topped up carboy. Now our wine's been settling for two days and we've got about two inches of sediment on the bottom, which is about how much we've expected. Um, you can smell it, it's just getting to smell a little bit musty, which is pretty typical after you let the wine sit on the lees like this. And we just don't want to let it sit any longer. Now that's not really a bad thing at this point. Um, it's kind of leaning a little bit, just a little bit reductive. So it's kind of the op opposite of oxidative or oxidized. So that's not a bad place to be because we are going to introduce yet a little bit more oxygen into this wine. I've got a three gallon carboy here and I preloaded it with just over an ounce of French medium toast oak cubes and yet a tiny tiny bit more FT Rouge, the, the tannin. And I've only added about a gram of that. I just kind of periodically add that. I really want things to bind with those color molecules as they try to drop out of that wine. Just create a little bit nicer, longer, silky tasty molecules. I'm going to do a little trick to get my racking cane started here. So I filled it with water and what I'll do is keep my thumb over one end, stick the racking cane in and let go on my thumb down here at the bottom and that water will come out, pull the wine with it, and now our racking cane's flowing. So now I've moved it into the little three gallon carboy. We can let it get a little bit of air now. If you're dealing with a higher pH wine, you know, something like 3.6, you would want to maybe add just a tiny bit of sulfite right now. But that tannin's going to help bind things up for us. We're going to be in pretty good shape here, I think. And we're going to keep this carboy topped up all the way to the neck. So we're going to do everything we can to eliminate any air exposure at this point. So finally, it's time to be very careful about oxidation. Now, if you get a little bit of the leaves when you're transferring at this point, not really a big deal. You're just trying to go from having like this big compacted two inch thick sledge to like a small dusting of leaves. That's not really a big deal. What I've got here 
so this is um, CH35 malolactic bacteria. So I'm going to put this wine through malolactic fermentation and naturally it's probably going to try to do it on its own but as I've said in the past I really like to choose my own malolactic bacteria when I have the chance. And CH35 is really really reliable. It's a good one to choose and I just happen to have some of it in my freezer so it's what I'm going to use. Another good one that I like to use for a red wine like this is CH16. So this will do a little bit better in high acid challenging situations. This wine's not particularly high acid. It's right about, right about where I want it to be really. But it'll do good. I've also got a growler here. So when this three gallon fills up we'll fill that little growler up. And I've got a couple wine bottles because I don't want to run out of things to put the wine in here. So we've ended up with a full three gallons and an almost full growler. So close to three and a half gallons. I've got a little two and a half gallon keg that I keep some dry red wine in, which is pretty awesome. Um, so I use that to top up my little half gallon growler here because I want to keep that topped up. If not, what I'd do with this wine is I'd probably use it for topping other carboys. I could put it in two bottles. Um, half gallon is about two and a half bottles, so that's probably about what I have is three full gallons and two bottles on top of that. So I'm going to go ahead and throw some of this CH35 freeze-dried malolactic bacteria in here. I'm just going to sprinkle just a tiny bit on the top. And you can get crazy and you can measure this stuff out, but you really just need enough to get a little culture started in there. And this stuff starts so easy. It's just like yeast. So I just put a little sprinkle on. Pretty confident that that's going to get this thing started. And I'll just give it a little wiggle here to get it under the surface. Don't really need to hydrate it, but you can if you'd like to. And then I've just got a couple fresh, clean, sanitized airlocks on here. These glass airlocks are pretty cool. I'll put a marble in the top just to keep any fruit flies out or anything, keep the dust out. But at this point, we're pretty good for this wine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let the malolactic fermentation complete. Um, we'll see some really slow bubbles. I'll keep the temperature about, you know, 65 degrees to 70 until malolactic fermentation completes, which should happen anywhere from, I mean, as fast as two weeks if you're on the high end of the temperature to as long as something like three months. And when malolactic fermentation is complete, um, if we end up with a little bit of lees on the bottom, I'll rack it again. But if not, I'll just give it a nice heavy hit of SO2. Um, I'm probably going to hit it with about 60 parts per million and that's going to be my one heavy dose of SO2. So I'd rather hit it once hard and let that sulfur dioxide kind of dip and drop as it kind of encounters a little air over time. By the time we get to bottling we're hopefully going to be very close to where we need to be and we'll just give it one more little bump. We're probably going to need something like 40 to 50 parts per million. Um, when this goes into bottle, let's say if the pH is in the 3.6 range. So that's really it. Um, now we're well on our way to having a really, really good wine. I will say when you're making a real legitimate wine from fresh grapes like this, or frozen grapes in this particular case, it's going to be a big, real, bold, just like a store-bought wine, but just like a store-bought wine, it's not going to be really ready for a while. This is probably going to be something like, um, you know, probably about eight months. Things are going to be coming around really, really nicely for this. I might even do a little tiny bit of blending at eight months. Um, and if everything's looking really good, we'll throw it in a bottle. And it's really going to come to life at something like one year. And you could store this for... If you sulfite it properly, um, you got a good clean wine, you could store this for years. Um, I would say two years we're going to be right in the sweet spot and two to 
four years, you're going to have a delicious wine on your hands. And you're going to be hard pressed to find a better wine at the store for unless you're going to spend big, big money. So I hope this helped you. I hope you get a chance to make wine from frozen grapes. I was really excited to try these out and I think we're going to have some, some just great, great wine. If you have any questions, post them in the comments and make sure to swing by my website, smartwinemaking.com. What I'll probably do is I'll write up a post about this exact process and you can kind of follow step by step. Thanks for watching.